Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We will be exploring the correlates of anomalous cognition. With me is Dr. Ed May, who is the co-author of the book Anomalous Cognition, Remote Viewing, Research, and Theory. He is also the co-editor of a two-volume anthology called Extra Sensory Perception, Support, Skepticism, and Science, and he is the co-author of ESP Wars East and West. For more than a decade, he was the scientific director of the military intelligence psychic spying program known as Stargate, a program that uh, he was a part of for a decade before that. He is also the recipient of a Lifetime Career Award from the Parapsychology Association. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, Jeffrey. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be with you. The correlates of anomalous cognition or extrasensory perception is something that has been of interest to researchers, oh gosh, going back to, to the early days of J.B. Rhine. Sure. Uh, there are two reasons you might be interested in what correlates with ESP. One mm -hmm. is to figure out how ESP works. That right. would be helpful. Another one is to establish it as being a genuine phenomenon. Mm -hmm. If you can say ESP correlates with something everyone else believes is real, you've got to step up on that procedure. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is a little technical, but I, I do want to explore this with you. Parapsychologists refer to research that attempts to examine these correlates as process-oriented research. That's a good way of wording it because you're trying to understand the process. Why, yeah. What else would you name it? Well, the problem, as I understand it, with process-oriented research is that it is always inevitably contaminated by the experimenter effect. Oh dear, that's a whole nother hour conversation. <laughs> yeah. Let's put that aside for a moment. Okay. Because let's see what kind of correlates we're looking for. Okay. Let, that, that's fine. I just want to keep it out there because uh, it's something that uh, I've been aware of. Yes, me too. Yeah. And it, it's actually a troublesome problem, not only for parapsychology people, it turns out to be a troublesome problem for any kind of basic all, research. Certainly all the behavioral sciences. Yes. And, and by the experimenter effect, what, what we mean is just for our viewers, we won't dwell on it, but the, uh, the idea that if an experimenter has a cherished hypothesis, uh, and we all do, yeah, that they might be able to uh, develop a, or design or influence a research study in a way to conform with their cherished hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, if you assume that extrasensory perception is real, that adds another wrinkle to the whole uh, complexity of it all. Well, I'm hoping we'll have an opportunity to go into this in depth when we talk about models, how the ESP yeah. works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, the kinds of correlates we're going to talk about, mm -hmm. I suppose it's fair to say, fall into three large categories. Correct. We'll look at physical correlates, yes. physiological correlates, Indeed. and psychological correlates. That's correct. Let's start with the psychological. You would pick the hardest to begin with. Would you rather start? No, no, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> Put me on the spot. Okay. Um, it's hard to find psychological correlates to normal everyday life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, in fact, psychology itself as a discipline, if you've been reading the New York Times lately, has come under great attack that the quality of research in psychology is problematical. I'm not beating up on that. All them, the social and behavioral yeah. sciences and, and biological sciences, yes, too, exactly. are under attack right now. Okay, so again, let's set that aside and say, what did we look at in terms yeah. of trying to answer the following question? Mm -hmm. What are the best psychological profiles of people who would be good remote viewers? Yeah. Okay, we looked at a lot of things, mm -hmm. and the net net of that research, we found no stable correlations of psychological inventories mm -hmm. against any VSP. Now, there are some that are well known. Yeah. And sometimes people say, well, extroverts make, make really good subjects, yeah. or introverts make really good subjects. Yeah. It turns out that's an artifact of how you collect the data, mm -hmm. not something that's 
inherent into the nature but of ESP. But I you can well imagine that viewers, uh, average viewer of an interview like this might be thinking, well, I know people who are more metaphysical mm -hmm. and uh, more spiritual, that a, a spiritually oriented person is more open to extrasensory perception. Uh, that's the meme that is out there. Yeah. We are unable to confirm that under laboratory conditions. Mm -hmm. And there are other memes that women somehow are better than men at yeah. this. They're more open. And mm -hmm. yeah, they're more open, but they're not necessarily better psychics. Mm -hmm. So part of our tasking was is to find out, well, if those aren't true, and they might have been, who are the right ones? Yeah. And so we have some rough examples in, in, in this very crude idea of the psychology. One is, if you are satisfied about your station in life, you could be a garbage collector or a, a, a neuroscientist, and mm -hmm. you're happy with what you're doing, you're more likely to be a good remote viewer. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are not consumed in your personality, wrapped around your ability to be psychic, you're much better as a mm -hmm. psychic. Uh, one of our people, Dr. Nevin Lance, is a practicing psychologist. And I asked him once, how do you integrate this so well into your normal everyday life? He said, I wish I could in integrate the rest of my life as well as I do. <laughs> uh -huh. and that turns out to be a real problem because many, some people are unable to, in, to integrate it into their life and start defining themselves in terms of their psychic ability. Yeah. And that, that's an actual problem. I, I would think so because then you get your ego involved. We had to actually, and the government program had to actually dismiss people who got involved in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. Now, what about altered states of consciousness? There are many, you know, there's a lot of folklore that, for example, meditation, oh, hypnosis, sure. and so on are psi conducive states of awareness. Including lucid dreaming, for mm -hmm. example. Yes. Um, other dreaming itself, for example. Yes. Uh, the, the best thing you can say about it, altered states of consci consciousness seem not to inhibit ESP. Mm. It is not, it, it, you know, there's a phrase in science, is it uh, a necessary or uh, condition or not? Mm -hmm. It's not a necessary, but it might be a substantial con uh, pro part mm -hmm. of that process. I don't think an altered state is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done remote viewing with someone who's seasick in a submarine, works just fine. We have other people who are great meditators yeah. and they do ex excellently. So I don't know how that impacts in the psychological but, range. But there certainly have been double blind studies oh, sure. comparing control groups with people who are in an altered state yeah. that do show a difference. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a necessary condition is an open question yeah. because we have people who never do a medication meditation at all yeah. who are equally as good. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean, it's not a necessary condition. Uh -huh. So it might be what's called a sufficient condition. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the psychology, the bottom line is uh, there's a lot of interesting data, but very few firm conclusions. That's right. The way we word it is there are no stable correlates to psychological inventories across a wide range mm -hmm. of them. And it might well be that uh, you've got uh, subtle interactions between personality types. Definitely and, we do. And all, different altered states of consciousness. Yes. And so one of the big issues there, it, it sort of um, indicates, gives you a suggestion that maybe how ESP is processed in the brain is beyond that part it, that it is processed and subjected to personality variables like everything else you do. Mm -hmm. That would say that there isn't anything unique about the psychology of psi because it's processed in the brain like everything else. Mm -hmm. Like hearing. Or, of course. Uh, or perception in general. Yeah. yeah. That it, it's just another form of perception. Exactly. Uh -huh. Well, there are people who argue that uh, maybe I'm getting a bit far afield. People who say it's not a form of perception, that it's a, uh, a, a result of synchronicity or a result of uh, strange uh, twists in the space-time continuum. Or, anyhow, I... You're really far afield <laughs> here. I am. I am. Let's, let's get back to our agenda. Let's look at the physical course. Yeah, all right. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the reasons we want to look at physical correlates is because if we can say ESP is correlating with something everybody believes is real, that says, well, maybe we ought to pay more close attention to this. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague James Spottiswood uh, really gets credit for this. He looked at a physical f effect, although it's really a geometric one, called right. local sidereal time. Mm -hmm. And sailors know about it. That's how you navigate around the planet. Mm -hmm. and long story short, he found a very strong 
evidence that at certain hours of the uh, local sidereal clock time, mm -hmm. which is uh, and on September 21st, it, your clock time and sidereal time line up, forget what else happens, yeah. <laughs> that's the easiest thing. And at, at one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, you get a magnificent enhancement of LS, of, lo of your psi ability. Mm -hmm. And at um, six o'clock in the evening, it goes away mm -hmm. on the average. Mm -hmm. Now, we think we understand that, and it's a bit geeky to go into that in some detail right now. It turns out to be a noise-related thing, that mm -hmm. at, at some magical reason we don't understand, at, thir at one o'clock in the afternoon, the amount of stuff that's just flooding through your mind quiets and allows you to be yeah. more receptive to whatever the ESP well, so task. Well, say real time is the relationship of the Earth to the stars, exactly. the background stars, yes. as opposed to the sun. Thank you. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh -huh. So it suggests that at, uh, I guess it's 13 hours and 13 and yeah. 30 minutes, yeah. 1.30, uh, local sidereal time, which is different in every geometrical, uh, geographical location on the planet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something is happening physically. Something appears to be, yeah. and it's a huge mystery. But right let now. me ask you this. Now, I know the, the study was published originally and then replicated once as it held up over time? Uh, yes and no. Uh, James and uh, Peter Starak published a paper sort of withdrawing mm. the whole idea to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I have been um, critical of that assumption. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, very stable effect. And okay. they say, well, it's really an artifact, and that's current science discussion about how to resolve that. Yeah. Another one, though, is the geomagnetic field. You know, mm -hmm. you walk outside with a compass and you yeah. know where north is, right? Yes. And if you could magically look at the end of the compass as wiggling, yeah. that's called the geomagnetic field fluctuations. Right. It's very, very, very small. Mm -hmm. And the, the person who first noticed this was a guy named Michael Persinger by looking at the geomagnetic field and spontaneous ESP mm -hmm. events. Yes. He said, oh, that can't be. And we studied it in the laboratory, and there it is. Yeah. Why? We don't know. No. When the geomagnetic field is high or low? Ah, you would have to ask that question. <laughs> when it's quiet, you're much better off. Well, and so that suggests that the geomagnetic noise, subtle as it is, yeah. is somehow interfering with the uh, brain's ability to integrate extrasensory perception exactly. and, uh, data. Exactly. And in fact, that shouldn't be a big <clears throat> surprise. Uh, none of our participants are homing pigeons, but mm -hmm. if they were, there'd be a big problem. Yeah. Because when homing pigeons, they have contests who can do the best homing pigeons. If there's wild geomagnetic fluctuations, they all get lost. So these very subtle changes can influence behavior mm -hmm. at the macroscopic level, including ESP. That's fascinating. And, and th now there's, we're beginning to get a real handle. That's the whole idea, uh -huh. exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I, I know I interviewed Stanley Krippner not long ago, and he found similar correlations yeah. in his own data. Yeah, it's worldwide. We've seen mm -hmm. everybody's data. Yeah, now let's go back for a moment to the local sidereal time, because yeah. I have heard the hypothesis that at, at one o'clock local sidereal time mm -hmm. is when uh, the Earth itself is pointed away from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Yes, in fact, the way you think of this, if you walk outside and face north and south and you have a line right overhead, mm -hmm. that is pointing exactly vertically out of the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. That suggests that the center of our galaxy has got something to do with this. A noise source. A noise source. And yeah. uh, it, it makes my brain hurt, as Dean Radin is fond of saying, <laughs> because <laughs> the amount of energy coming from the center of our galaxy, I get more by rubbing my pants. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, how in blazes can that, in fact, affect human behavior? Mm -hmm. I, I, and one level, I don't believe it, but there's the data. I got to, I got to worry about it. Yeah. Well, it, it, we're dealing with a subtle phenomenon. Yeah, indeed. A delicate phenomenon yes. that might well be affected by delicate. Uh, fluctuations in the environment. Well, Spottiswood and I were getting so frustrated. Well, maybe the mothership is parked out there <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> causing all of this. Yeah, it's a current challenge, and that's an area for hopefully some young people who <clears throat> are smarter than we will come in and figure it out. But this is some of the most uh, important data th th that we have regarding uh, nailing down extrasensory perception or anomalous cognition from a scientific perspective. Yeah, and in fact, Spottiswood carried it a bit further 
here, he looked at epileptic seizures as whether they're correlated with the geomagnetic field fluctuation. He found a weak but statistically significant effect. Mm -hmm. So there you have some, quote, real thing. Everybody knows what a seizure is and yeah. no one disbelieves it. Yeah. And we have the magnetic field fluctuations. Nobody disbelieves that. And yet that correlation is there. And I gather there have been <laughs> some correlations with phases of the moon. Uh, one of the researchers, Dean Radin, thinks so. I'm not sure it's real yet, but yeah. you know, that's part of science. Mm -hmm. So I know he has some data about uh, casino uh, profits in Las Vegas. I know. <laughs> he was really good at that. <laughs> I'm going to come here and gamble <laughs> at the right times. Yeah. Well, the last correlation I think of interest is brain correlates. Mm -hmm. What's going on in the central nervous system? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The net net of that is we do not find any stable correlations, and there's a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Everything that we know interacts with the brain. Yeah. And one study we did at Stanford is called, I'll say it in jargon, an event-related desynchronization. What that means in English is where our brains, a, lay, a brain in idle is producing 10 oscillations a second called mm -hmm. alpha rhythm. Right. Everything we know that a human being can do can interrupt that. Mm -hmm. So if I poke you, the, uh, the uh, alpha goes away. If I uh, rub your skin or you touch something, alpha goes away. If you think you're, uh, of your favorite uh, beach scene, alpha goes away. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, if everything like that makes it go away, psi must make it go away also. Uh -huh. We did this lengthy study and we had lots of independent statistical, in fact, very strong statistical evidence of psi while we were measuring people's EEG. Yes. Good news. Mm -hmm. No evidence of the central nervous system correlate at in, all. In, in fact, there's some folklore that suggests alpha waves are uh, psi conducive. Sorry, <laughs> not in our data. <laughs> that doesn't work either. We expected <clears throat> the alpha rhythm to go away, and mm -hmm. actually, we invented uh, a process that published about uh, it was three times, 300 percent more sensitive than the way people normally measure this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and still nothing. So here's the problem. Yeah. Since we said that we don't know when, where, and how long psi happens, so you're coming to our laboratory, you're pulling into the parking lot, you have a psychic hit because you don't have control when you're psychic. Yeah. Everything you're ever going to learn about the psychic task in your future has is done. Mm -hmm. We put you in the, whatever brain thingy we're measuring you with. Yeah. It's You're not going to see anything psi because psi isn't happening then. It happened when you pulled into the parking mm -hmm. lot. That's a big problem I don't know how to solve. In fact, I turned back some money. I had a $150,000 grant to study ESP in a, <clears throat> F, a functional fMRI machine right. in Edinburgh, Scotland. I sent the money back. Well, I do know that uh, some studies uh, of that sort have been reported. Yes. Uh, Norman Don, I think, at the University of Chicago found yes. uh, fMRI correlates yep. uh, when people were uh, doing successful Indeed uh, anomalous did, cognition. But they were not stable across time. Yeah. I myself have found them with Hella Hammett. We had some fantastic work in the early years. And, you know, it moved around to different electrodes yeah. <laughs> and then would go away. We, and we don't have stable. The, instant, the yeah. operative term is stable. Correlate. But, you know, with, with regard to the brain, mm -hmm. even the very famous studies of Wilder Penfield. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Stimulating yeah. different parts of, of the brain and producing mental images. Those correlates, uh, as famous as they are, were not stable over time either. Exactly. So, and look, people... Let's take something really real. Mm -hmm. That is the experience we all have when we're in love. Mm -hmm. You cannot see any correlation of the brain when you're in love as opposed to um, hungry. Mm -hmm. Now, there are certain <laughs> brain sim things that you really can tell. I can tell whether you're asleep, but I can't tell the difference between when you're dreaming or awake. Mm -hmm. Because as far as your central nervous system is concerned, when you're dreaming, you're awake. Mm -hmm. And so you get beta and all the stuff that you normally yeah. get. So if I can't tell whether you're asleep or dreaming in your brain, how the blazes will I expect something subtle like ESP to be able to pop, pop, pop its head? Mm -hmm. Well, now there's another angle when it comes to physiological uh, correlates, mm -hmm. and that that is all the presentiment research. Excellent research, and one of the reasons what what is that is that is look, we're going to show you in your future a scary picture, mm -hmm. and if I show you now a scary picture, we all respond scarily. What yeah. do we mean? That our palms get a little sweaty, right? 
And so you can measure, you have a, this gadget called a sweaty palm detector. The galvanic the, skin response. That's a, that's a geeky way of saying it. <laughs> I, I like sweaty palm detector. <laughs> so if I, if I sneak up behind <clears throat> you and go clap with a real loud sound, you jump, right? Yep. And you're, you get sweaty in your palms and you can mm -hmm. measure that very precisely, galvanic skin, but is uh, electrodermal response or more mm -hmm. or skin conductance response. Yeah. Okay, so people wondered, and Dean Radin and, and our group, we said, well, maybe if I'm going to show you a, a scary picture in your future or come up behind you in your future and clap my hands, will your body detect that? Mm -hmm. And it would be great if it did because when humans are really uh, terrible, we have a horrible uh, capacity of describing our experiences. I'm not negating experience, mm -hmm. but the data are about 40% of the interpretation of our experience is just completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And there are two professions, just to be fun about it, that are predicated on that observation. Magicians, mm -hmm. <laughs> you think you know yeah. what's going on, baby, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> and psychotherapists. Mm. Jeffrey, I've just fell in love with this fantastic woman. She's the my soulmate, and you say to me as a therapist, Ed, when are we going to get back in addressing the fact you hate your mother? <laughs> 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 so yeah. that, that aspect of interpretation, if we can find a way of you telling me about your psychic experience, which is not overlaid by all this stuff going through your mind, yeah. we're ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. And that's why we did this. Uh, we we replaced the pictures with scary sounds. Right. And we had an enormously strong effect. Mm -hmm. In other words, that the, the body responds in advance of yes. the stimulus. Exactly. E and even uh, whether or not the person is able to articulate what they're feeling. Usually not. Mm -hmm. uh, Hella Hammond was the first example of this back in the 70s, and she was asked to guess whether a flashing light was happening down the hall. She couldn't guess at all, but her EEG could guess pretty well. Mm -hmm. And well, so uh, uh, there's, there's sort of the hand-waving, if you will, evolutionary argument in favor of this. Mm -hmm. Let's suppose you're sitting in your cave way back when, and you want to go down to the stream and get water, and you walk outside and you're totally surprised by the saber-toothed tiger who's interested in having you for lunch. But if somehow you could be pre-aware, arouse your, your autonomic nervous system just a little bit, you might not even be aware, all of a sudden you've primed the pumps so and when you walk outside you can get away from the tiger. Mm -hmm. So there might be some... You know, survival kind of advantage. Survival advantage. Uh -huh. you know, that's a lot of hand-waving, but it's an interesting idea. Well, the, so the pre-sentiment uh, response, yeah. would, that's a, kind of a precognition effect in the body. Of course, yeah. Uh, and the other physical correlations that we talked about, geomagnetic fluctuations and local sidereal time, all of that research helps to bring parapsychology into the fold of mainstream science. Yes, and if we are really successful at it, we have done our job at parapsychologists. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are two areas where you can say we're beginning to get a handle. Absolutely true. Mm -hmm. That's very significant. <laughs> I think so too. Why do you think I'm sitting here? <laughs> it's a job that, you know, I, I sit here and think how privileged I have been mm -hmm. that someone paid me to do this for my whole entire career. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's fair to say that when you first began working in the field, we didn't have this knowledge. We did not. This is knowledge that has accumulated in our lifetime. Yeah, and with many different researchers, not just our lab or just not me. What I love about it is an interdisciplinary effect with a lot of very talented people. You know, there's some really crummy ones out there, but that's mm -hmm. true of every uh, world of science. Mm -hmm. But it's been, it's been thrilling. Mm -hmm. and, but on the other hand, when it comes to psychological correlates, we are hardly any better off today than we were 50 years ago. No. Uh, uh, Chuck Connerton, uh, one of the stalwarts in the field, the late Chuck Connerton, mm -hmm. analyzed psychology data, uh, psychology papers, and compared them to the same period of time of parapsychological papers. We're, the parapsychology world are in much better shape. We replicate stuff more often, and the, when we try to replicate it, it works, and in parapsychology, uh, psychology is terrible. Why would anybody believe psychology? <laughs> <laughs> well. I think that's one of the reasons why psychologists amongst all professionals are the most hostile to parapsychology. Indeed they are. Because they feel the most threatened. Yep. Well, also, they, they the other side of that, I'll defend them a little bit, yeah. please forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll defend them because they are aware of ways we humans can mislead ourselves. Yeah. And I learn a lot from that kind of thinking about uh, 
Am I misleading myself? I want to mm -hmm. know. Sure. Uh, the other side of that, the uh, engineers and physicists are the easiest to, to predict, uh, that, that buy the story. Uh -huh. And uh, they're the easiest one to fool. The <laughs> easiest to mislead. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, I, 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 will, I will buy that. But I also think that uh, typically speaking, when you, you talk about the pecking order of, so we know parapsychologists are at the very bottom, but they are. just above them are psychologists. <laughs> they may not agree. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you one, one brief little story. I went to see Doug Henning, who was a marvelous magician yes. in New York, yeah. and I was thoroughly entertained. I said, okay, I'm a physics guy. I'm coming back here. I'm going to pay a lot of money. Third row center. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out one trick only. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there glaring at the whole thing. I couldn't figure out one thing. Yeah. One other quick story, Daryl Bem, one of the major researchers in our field. A psychologist. Psychologist yeah. and a very accomplished magician. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was at my house for dinner and my wife and my daughter and, and he was sitting opposite me. At the, and after we finished our coffee, he said, I'll do a little trick. I'm going to push a coin through your dining room table. And he would do that. Huh. And he would say, okay, you know it's a trick. I said, yes. And he violates the rules. He said, let me tell you how I did that trick. Mm -hmm. And so he shows how it was a sleight of hand. Yeah. He actually didn't have the coin in his hand. It was already in the cup when he went underground. Uh -huh. And he can then show you that was sleight of hand mm -hmm. and then do it in slow motion. You could see it. Mm -hmm. Now, armed with the information, you know for sure it's a trick and you know when and where and how it's happening. When he did it at full speed, you couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. Well, that argues uh, that parapsychologists should be employing professional magicians. No, not at all, because uh, the fact is, it's, it argues against first person is witnessing of a phenomenon. Uh -huh. That's what it really argues okay. against. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, uh, I'll buy that. <laughs> Good, you better. <laughs> Ed May, once again, our time is up. It goes fast when you're having fun. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks so much. Ed. My pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.